We have been collectively reading Tobias Leonard's newest book. And in case you don't know who Tobias Leonard is, Tobias Leonard is like the most hated vampire within the vegan movement. <laughs> and if you don't know why, he's a kind of infamous and highly controversial figure. You can just look at the front cover of his book. It says, with an introduction by Peter Singer. Dun, dun, dun. It has been actively promoted by Peter Singer on social media. He's got an introduction tacked onto the front of the book. And that's a funny thing in itself when you think about it, because Peter Singer was an establishment mainstream figure in animal rights and at least vegetarianism a few decades ago, if not veganism. But today, he's kind of a controversial, I think, widely hated figure <laughs> in the movement. And, you know, Tobias... He's also now kind of regarded as an enfant terrible, as a provocative and largely hated figure. So, with this having been said, I invited him on the show. I've invited him to come on and do an interview with me. And my reason for making this video now is that I think the first argument in the book, a book I have not yet finished reading, by the way, I think there's kind of enough to talk about there to make a standalone video. Okay? Now, I'm springing this on my girlfriend. I do this stuff with no script and no prep because it's more spontaneous that way. But this is the argument. I'm now going to summarize Tobias's argument, and then I can contrast my own view, and my girlfriend can jump in at any time. The first argument, I mean, at the first 25, 30% of the book is setting out, really boils down to a kind of plea for vegans and reducitarians to embrace each other. You know, literally as well as figuratively, I have a photograph right here on my hard drive of Tobias Leonard embracing a, uh, a, redu a reducitarian, right? I have a photograph of him at the reducitarian conference. Futures. Yeah, 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 yeah. There it is. Yeah. So th this is him literally hugging a reducitarian. Okay, they're not well, hugging. Taking okay. a selfie. All right, okay. Is this generation's. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, uh, you know, he breaks bread with reducitarians. He sometimes refers to himself as a reducitarian rather than a vegan. And, a, and there's a large part of this book is devoted to basically just supporting reducitarians as having compatible goals and compatible, compatible positive outcomes with, with vegans. Right. He offers the following protracted allegory to explain why he sees this way and at the same time it explains why the vast majority of vegans do not see it that way. He once spoke to a woman who is a celiac. Celiac disease, which is devilishly hard to spell. I had one relative in my family with celiac disease. Celiac disease is the condition that really requires you to never eat gluten. Okay? <clears throat> that is not the same thing as so-called gluten intolerance. Celiac disease is a very real medical problem. And this woman's life has in some, way, have in some ways been made more difficult by, and in some ways made easier, by the larger and larger number of people who do not have any medical problem, but who are buying gluten-free products. Right? So the parallel to veganism should jump out at you already. Uh, we all know that in the last 20 years, soy milk has become easier and easier to purchase in the Western world. Mm -hmm. It's not because the number of vegans has increased exponentially. There are more and more people who are not vegan who are buying soy milk. He throws out some statistics that some vegan restaurants, 70% of their customers are non-vegan, people who never will be vegan. They're people who are reducitarian or just meat eaters who want to eat a vegan meal once in a while. They're meat eaters who just like the food, but in a very real economic sense, they're providing the basis for them. So he's saying there's a push and pull here. There's a kind of ethical fissure between people who are real celiacs, people who really have celiac disease on the one hand, and people who are fake celiacs. Because keeping it real, that's what we're talking about. People who pretend to be gluten intolerant and buy gluten-free bread and gluten-free breakfast cereal and all kinds of stuff, but you don't actually have this medical condition. So naturally, there's a kind of uh, moral antipathy or conflict there. But he's saying if you take a step back and look at it in terms of the actual cycle, the actual economic outcomes, what have you, you really are playing on the same team and the fake celiacs are making life easier for the real celiacs. Therefore, ipso facto, the fake vegans are making life better for the real vegans, even if there's a natural hatred of you know vegans hating reducitarians as fake vegans. Yeah. Well, I will just add... This is kind of unrelated, but also somewhat related. Today, I just saw news that Nestle bought Sweet Earth, which is originally oh. a vegan brand, mm -hmm. vegan brand of faux meat. And Nestle is obviously yes, mm, the most, they're in it for the, the money. most hated. Yeah, <laughs> but um, you know, it make, makes me think of it because 
it they now with Nestle buying it, I think I think Sweet Earth will be available in far more sure. stores than they are right now. Now they I could think scale it's probably up. like specialized health food stores. Right. Um, and while I can see a lot of people boycotting probably in the future, um, also I, I heard people are boycotting Dea too because they were just bought out by a company that also tests on animals. I, look, so I've, anyway, I've heard, but, but at the same time, you see vegans going nuts because Ben and Jerry's puts out one vegan variety. Yeah. So I mean, it's right, right, and they've forever made just dairy ice cream. So yeah, yeah, that's true. But anyway, v- vegans yeah. like to boycott stuff. I mean, you know, that's that's fact one. Yeah. But yeah, it's a little bit crazy. Yeah. But yeah, I'm. I'm I, I can see that argument being totally sure. safe and right. sound to me. Like, I mean, uh, more people that right, but, are but like... But it has an introduction by Peter Singer, so we hate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, no, but what's interesting, too, is generally there are several arguments in the first uh, 30% of the book where he's actually more conservative than I am. I'm using the word conservative within the context of veganism, like he more adheres to a traditional vegan perspective, and I go much further than him. Yeah. So uh, uh, let's, let's think of some examples. Um, he very politely and mildly criticizes the link between social justice movements and veganism. He yeah. very vaguely and politely suggests that veganism is not really a social justice movement in the way some vegans portray it to be. Right. I go way further than him right, on that. Right. This he channel, says right? maybe maybe right. you will s- maybe you determine animals to be people, but other people don't. <laughs> like that was what right, he said. Like right, maybe right. maybe we feel this way, but other people don't feel that animals are even right. on the same level. As humans. Right. So. He, he very vaguely and politely suggests that the arguments equating animal exploitation with human slavery are weak. Yeah. I go much further than that in this channel. And, you know, I deal with specific examples and specific sources and say, look, this is direct action everywhere's position, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, in some ways, I'm much more radical than he is. Mm-hmm. And I just say critics of his accuse him of being a radical pragmatist or an extreme pragmatist. So, in some ways, I am more pragmatic than him, although in some ways, I'm more principled. I think within this video, you know, you're going to see that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so to contrast my own view here, I think what's missing is the big C word. I used to talk about this a long time ago, I think like two years ago, which is culture. We can talk about political change. We can talk about dietary change. We can talk about change in health guidelines given up by the government. Sometimes we're just talking about the diet aspect of veganism. We can talk about economic change. But cultural change is, I think, really the category we have to talk about these changes within. So uh, in terms of bringing about cultural change, Let's talk about the perception of cigarettes, as an example, instead of uh, gluten-free. Yes, obviously, you're going to have a tiny percentage of the population that actually become anti-smoking activists. Why would you? Why would you? There's a much larger percentage of the population who will quit smoking, right? So the tiny, tiny number, way less than 1%, I'm sorry, fewer than 1%, fewer than (laughs) uh, become actual anti-smoking activists. And then there's you know millions of people who actually quit smoking or who struggle to quit smoking. And then there's maybe a larger number, depends on where you're living, who don't quit smoking, who continue smoking, but who start to adopt the cultural attitude that smoking is a bad thing, right. who share in the overall assumption, the shift, compared to the 1940s when people actually thought this stuff was healthy for you, thought it wasn't a problem at all, shifting into a worldview that, yeah, this is something that has to be phased out over time. Put it this way, there's a larger percentage of smokers, even if they continue smoking, even if they're not trying to quit, they would not want their own son or daughter to start smoking. They right. acknowledge. So yeah, likewise. Or that example right. that you said, they don't want their boyfriend or their daughter's boyfriend or girlfriend right. to be smokers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your daughter starts dating a new guy. You see, he smokes cigarettes. You don't think, oh, that's okay because I'm a smoker too. You you think he's a bad guy. Yeah, you have right. this kind of prejudice. Right? So sure, that's that's a process of cultural change. But the tiny percentage of people who are actually anti-smoking activists, and that may include like a cancer surgeon, someone who specialized in lung cancer and people who do research on these different factors, they're actually going to lobby for change at city hall, provincial parliament, federal parliament, if you live in the United States, Congress, the Senate, however you want to put this, mm-hmm. right? So there's a, there's, a, there's a political aspect in which we really need to be especially concerned about and focused on that tiny percentage. So, you know, the, the pure vegans or everyone to put it, the highly motivated, we don't have to think of them as representative of the population as a whole. We don't have to think of them as leading a transformation of the population as a whole that's going to make them resemble that tiny minority. You know, the activist minority... I think it's it's wrong and misleading to think of them in mass market terms, think about what their importance is. 
And again, that's only the legal and political change. If you're talking about cultural change, the same way a small number of artists, a small number of musicians cause a huge change, but they're 110% committed, like these activists, that's what I'm really interested in. I'm interested in a small number of people who can cause a, you know, a, a big cultural change and who will cause a big cultural change. And my analysis, my perspective, isn't really incompatible with Leonard's. What's incompatible is really the question of what do we do now? He's saying let's put our effort into supporting the long tail, if you like. He's talking about it as a, as a line chart, yeah. of, of, of soft core reducitarians. And I'm saying, no, 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 this small percentage, the same with, you know, if you talk about anti-smoking activists or, you know, uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Mothers Against Drunk Driving are basically anti-alcohol activists. That's a tiny percentage of the population. I'm not saying the future everyone is going to become a member of Mothers Against Drunk Driving, but this small percentage of the population can have an impact. And there's a large number of people who've quit drinking. There are people who are still drinking, but who are now regard it as a bad and dangerous thing, who change their cultural attitudes, right? Yeah. So when I see it that way, he is looking at it in terms of mass market and a cycle of bringing out more and more products, more economically viable products, mm -hmm. making life easier for vegans. And that is true. I'm not refuting that, but I'm looking at a cycle of cultural change and political leadership. I don't know if you call it the other side of the coin or the other side of the equation, and I'm saying, no, 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 we, we've got to focus our, our energy and efforts over here. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. I, I thought that was interesting when you pointed it out when we were reading it together. That, yeah. Um, we really, maybe we don't need more than 5% of the population right. to be vegan to... right. You know, for there to be vegan options you know like we can we can lobby for there to be vegan options and like you mentioned in taiwan that there are vegan options in every train station right like just in in schools like you know you don't have to have a religious majority for there to be kosher meals to, for there well, to be um that's right and i think that's the paradoxical thing about being principled I and mean, if you think about it why does a tiny minority like you know the jews have all the access to kosher meals well, it's because our society recognizes the principle of the thing. Like, okay, we have to make a little bit of effort, whether it's at the airport or the hospital, to provide these special meals for these people because there's an important principle here. Whether you think of that as the principle of religious diversity or a secular multicultural society or if you actually believe in God or something, whatever the principle is, that's being recognized. So, yeah, it's, it's a, a, a bit paradoxical because it may seem to make sense that by being less and less principled, by being more and more flexible – you think you're going to get those outcomes. Mm -hmm. But another question is, can't we just get organized and get recognized? 5% is a huge percentage of the population yeah. where it's, okay, these people matter. You know, respecting their beliefs matters. You, you know, our society, the society is going to accommodate us to the same extent that they accom accommodate maybe Jews and Muslims and what have you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, that's... The, mm -hmm. You know, I met one girl who was part of an activist movement on a university campus in England, one of the major universities there, where they ended up just getting veganism uh, recognized as a religion. They yeah. added it to the list because that was the easiest way to solve the problem. They really had problems with vegans being able to get food. Uh, yeah. At, yeah. Anyway, basically in campus uh, cafeterias and so on. It was like, well, you guys are knocking yourselves out to offer halal meat and all this other right. stuff. Mm -hmm. Why can't you make a little bit of an effort so there's, you know, nutritionally complete vegan meals? And that was that was the shortcut. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, look. Uh, and I'm I, I just want to say I'm all for, you know, people that are going to vegan restaurants that sure. aren't. And, you know, you've, you've mentioned that opening a vegan restaurant or a sure. vegan bakery or whatever probably is the easiest, like, not, not, sure, I'm not saying sure, it's sure, easy, sure, but it's sure. like a good way to be a political activist. It's like, the most underrated form of activism activist, is right. that you actually get involved with food um, services, right? Yeah, because you yeah. attract people to veganism just by having good food, by having people sure. come to the restaurant because they've heard it's good, and, and even it, though it's vegan. like Make it possible for vegans to be vegan. Yeah, sense, and also, but. like, even if people just go to a vegan restaurant because they're like, oh, well, I'll be healthy for one night. Yeah, <laughs> you know? right. It's like, um, you know, I, I... Some some people quit drinking for just one night. <laughs> 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 they're packing the bottle, right? Right, For yeah. sure. But, I mean, you know, if you're talking about seatbelt legislation... I don't think there ever was a point in America's history where 5% of the population really cared about seatbelt legislation. I know. Right? I know. So a small percentage of people were passionate about that. They published a hit book. They started appearing on the news. Yeah. And they drove through important legislation that changed the way Americans live their lives every day. The seatbelt is now a fixture of your life every day. There's an issue of principle there. You know, there's an issue of, you know, body count of dead bodies in the street. Right. You know, they're ethical as well as, as well as practical issues. But no, if you think they mobilized 5% of the population, 
population to come like rise up on the streets or something. No, that's not how it happened. So I just say, I guess Tobias has a point in saying, don't underestimate the soft core, quite possibly hypocritical, uh, fake vegans reducing their answer because they, they're in yeah. they're in a hypocritical position. You know, mm-hmm. we can call it whatever you want to call it. Okay, so we can say, all right, that's 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 duly noted. But then I can say from my perspective, those people aren't the people who ever passed new legislation for seatbelts. It wasn't people who just passively said, gee, you know, my cousin Morty, he got killed in this car accident. He didn't he didn't really have to die if he had these cars. You know, mm, mm, but I don't really care enough to do anything about it. Right. Uh, uh, yes, of course, there's a larger number of people, millions, who passively thought seatbelts were a good idea, but didn't. we have to value and work with and work on and we ourselves become and raise money for and get organized for and pass new laws for and with that tiny percentage of people who really make the difference. Not only politically, but I'm saying here culturally. I think culture is really the missing term in this kind of analysis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when you mentioned Mothers Against Drug Driving and also the seatbelt legislation, to me, like, at first when I was thinking about that, um, I thought, well, veganism isn't so direct. Like, you don't see people dying immediately from right. eating meat. Yeah, like, it's yeah, not yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. oh, well, he ate too much meat one night and died. You know, like yeah. like alcohol, you can have too much alcohol in one night and die. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, veganism doesn't have that going for it. But at the same time, you know, if you look at the long term, uh, how much how much the vegan diet can benefit well, the human the human body you okay, know, with, okay, with okay. cancer. Okay. And... Jump in, though. Yeah. We have the unbelievably awful spectacle of what happens in slaughterhouses every day. Right. And that is immediate and horrifying. Yeah, <laughs> so true. actually, when you think about it, we have <laughs> yeah, something right. on our side. Because, I mean, you know, I, I've seen it. I remember once I went to yeah. the, the police station. This was actually back when I was applying to become a police officer. Another story. I've, I've applied to join the Army. I've applied to join the police officer. i got stories. But anyway, I remember I walked in, and they had, they, had, they, had, they had an actual car from a car accident. You know, like someone had died in the, you know, where they picked up the car and put it inside. So there'd be this spectacle of, like, yeah. this can happen to you, you know. Right. So, no, I mean, I, I think it's true that different social movements the spectacle is an aspect of it yeah but you know i mean the most common story in the 21st century now the internet has changed this is people become vegan because they saw a youtube video of where their meat comes from or how how milk is actually made and they never thought about it before and that changes them so what you're saying is true Uh, you know hamburgers don't cause heart attacks in the same direct way that car accidents cause human death human fatalities however Hamburgers do cause the deaths of cows. Yeah, but it's just also interesting to think like if there are people who are tepid about the seatbelt legislation because of that, if they're just saying like, "Oh, well, you know, my yeah. cousin died, but I'm I, not, I don't care enough to go to Congress and say like there needs to be legislation on like yes. you know right. if people aren't aren't it's actually caring about minority. about humans like I, you know how many right. how many people are really gonna care about that to. Uh, um, Right. Change the rules for slaughterhouse, you know, change. But look, I mean, you know, videotape changes these things. You know, if if you read any, we're watching the HBO series Rome right now. Mm -hmm. But if you read any historical primary source documents, people who lived in slave societies knew happy slaves. Doesn't matter whether it was 1% of slaves or 20% of slaves that were happy in any given society, but they had slaves who were their friends and co-workers, and they say, oh yeah, well, I know this guy, and he's a slave. And he's okay, whether we're talking about ancient Rome or ancient Greece or even you know the Caribbean. Caribbean had very complex, layered, unequal slave societies. Not all slaves live in the same conditions. And that was a huge counterbalance where most people involved in slavery didn't see the worst excesses of slavery. They didn't see what happened on a sugar plantation in contrast to the slaves that may literally work at the Senate or the you know the yeah. most privileged slaves, maybe the ones you interact with the most. The slave who merely minds the shop for the local uh, smithy or what have you, local local craftsman or something. You know the slaves you, seemingly every day you were having encounters with slaves that reaffirmed the sense that in general your society, your society worked fine and you might not see somewhere you know you buy sugar in its finished product form and not realize the unbelievable horrors that are behind the, the sugar industry and again they, they had to use pamphlets and the relatively weak printing press I gotta tell you something I don't know anyone who looks at basic slaughterhouse footage you know the basic reality of a, of a sow lying on a concrete floor in one of those steel cages suckling its piglets where the sow can't even stand up or move mm. around the pigs literally can't turn around you guys are familiar with this stuff right. the reality of how artificial insemination works all this stuff I don't see anyone who looks at that and says, you know what? There are plenty of happy cows. There are plenty of happy <laughs> you know I mean? within this factory farming system. So, yeah, 
And again, shout out to Tobias. Tobias makes the point very briefly but very simply that we have a unique political challenge on our hands with veganism. It's nothing like the struggle to abolish slavery. It's nothing like this. It's none of that. It's unique. It's got unique advantages and unique disadvantages. But, you know, I'm willing to, to recognize those advantages as well. But yeah, in response to that spectacle, I guess the sad fact about human nature is a tiny percentage of people want to become activists and take it to yeah. parliament or take it to the artist studio, take it to the, you know, start creating. I mean, it may not be directly political, maybe through other creative means. Mm -hmm. They want to record a song and dance or paint a picture, whatever it is. But a small, small number of people become real activists. A small but significant part of people just become dietary vegans, you know, but are not activists or what have you. And then there's this larger number of people who just decide to cut down. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, and I can see that. You know, I can see that happening. I know it's conjecture, but I can see more people becoming vegan, you know, like, sure. or adopting a plant based diet, maybe sure, like 15% sure, sure. of the population. But still, most people would not care sure. enough to right. actually. Sure. Anything. Like, when things become more available in stores, right. I can actually see that being well, for me, and, leading and to the opposite. For me, the cultural, the cultural change is at what point in your culture are you an asshole? Because you say to somebody, hey, you know what? you got to wear your seatbelt if you're going to drive in my car. Yeah. And then at what point in your culture are you an asshole when you're the only guy who refuses to wear a seatbelt? You yeah. know, that was the cultural change you went through where seatbelts were, oh, fine. oh, you're going to force me to wear a seatbelt. This is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. To it really being the opposite where it's like, you know, what? Why don't you, what's the matter with you? Why aren't you wearing a seatbelt? Right, you know? right. So I think that's also the, the tipping point. And, you know, again, with, with cigarettes, there's a tipping point where, oh, oh, you're the one guy who, who refuses to sit around smoking with us, as opposed to you're the one guy who still goes outside and smokes cigarettes in the middle of a right. business meeting when that's, when that's disappeared. So, you know, that's the kind of question you're, you're going to ask is at what point do the, do the reducitarians and the fake vegans start to get that kind of leverage? But I'm not going to work for that. I'm not going to be out on that end of the, the tail. I'm not going to be out there trying to work with and collaborate with the people who are wishy-washy and don't really care and don't want to work for I'm going to work with the talented 10th who are really the talented one-tenth of 1%, one percent, the tiny minority within a tiny minority who are highly motivated, dynamic, creative people, whether involved in cultural process or political processes for for real change. If you're one of those people, you can Google my name. You can find my email. Hit me up. Let's get organized. Let's make it happen. I'm going to be back in Canada in December of this year, and then we are going to organize. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to take it to Parliament Hill. <laughs>